next uh, and the last uh, uh, talk for today's uh, forum uh, is my honor to introduce uh, Professor Peter Bruce, a uh, distinguished professor from Oxford University, United Kingdom. Uh, I have to say that uh, Professor um, Bruce's work on the uh, lithium uh, sulfur, lithium oxygen, the beyond lithium uh, electrochemistry is really well known in uh, all the people who are doing battery R&D. Uh, today, uh, I think uh, Professor Peter Bruce will share with us uh, his latest results on lithium rich cathodes with the anion redox, the oxygen redox. So uh, with that, uh, we welcome Professor Bruce, please. Okay, great. Yes. So you can hear me and see the slides. Yes, perfect. Excellent. Okay. So thanks again. Um, and I feel particularly sorry for you being up so late, um, but it's good of you to stay up uh, for this, uh, Shirley. Uh, so as Shirley mentioned, the title of my talk is Lithium Rich Cathodes with Oxygen Redox. I'm sure as everyone knows, the um, one of the big challenges in uh, moving forward with lithium ion batteries is to increase the energy storage, the energy density, and probably the biggest bottleneck to doing that, the biggest limitation to doing so, uh, lies with the, uh, with the cathode. And there are relatively few ways in which one can increase the, the energy storage in the cathode. And one of those uh, is to not only exploit, as we do with current generation uh, cathode materials, storing electrons on the transition metals, but if we could extend that to also carry out redox processes on the oxygen of our transition metal oxides, then we could increase the capacity uh, to store charge and potentially also do so at a relatively high uh, voltage, but one that is not so high that it's very challenging uh, for the electrolyte. And so that uh, is, has been one of the uh, areas that, that this field, of course, has researched for a number of years. Oxygen redox is not a new phenomenon. Uh, what we've tried to do is step back and try to understand the fundamental mechanism of oxygen redox, recognizing that although oxygen redox has the potential to give us those advantages of energy storage, it comes with a number of problems. Uh, a big loss of voltage on the first cycle, uh, continuous voltage fade, other problems, oxygen loss, etc. So to try to understand more about the fundamental underpinning mechanisms and then use that new knowledge to address some of the challenges, some of the limiting factors of oxygen redox so we can exploit its advantages in giving us more energy storage. So that's really been our driving force for the work that I want to present to you uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. So first of all, just let's remind ourselves of, of the challenge of improving on the cathode. So here's uh, a good old lithium cobalt oxide that started everything off. And what you see plotted here is the potential uh, versus the, um, uh, the specific capacity uh, of the uh, electrode versus, versus lithium metal. Um, we, of course, know that we can extend uh, the capacity of uh, these uh, transition metal oxide cathodes going to the so-called NMC materials, uh, which, of course, are still layered like LCO, uh, but this pushes up. Uh, our energy storage. One can go to these so-called high voltage cathodes like the nickel manganese spinel. Uh, they tend to have lower capacity but work at higher voltage. But of course it's challenging to find electrolytes that will work with uh, something at five volts at one end of the cell and, and at the anode at close to zero volts. Uh, there's interesting efforts at trying to get two electrons per transition metal uh, as the redox process instead of the one that we're limited to in our conventional materials. But then this is uh, what oxygen redox can, can do. It can extend, if it's in the layered compounds, this light blue curve or this light blue line here, it can extend the capacity, but also extend it in a voltage that is useful, relatively high, but not so high that it's challenging too much for the electrolyte. So being able to invoke both transition metal and oxygen redox processes to store electrons and do so at relatively high voltage um, is what can deliver with this uh, a high energy uh, density. So that's the, that's the advantage of these so-called lithium-rich cathodes, why 
they're an attractive way forward potentially for um, improving energy storage in lithium ion cells. Um, but um, as I'm sure many know, there are of course problems. Uh, here's the one of the classic lithium rich materials. It's uh, lithium rich NMC, so nickel manganese cobalt and crucially also lithium on the transition metal sites. So these are the transition metal ions here. Here's the structure, transition metal ions, lithium ions, and then the lithium ions, of course, between the layers. And this is a typical first uh, charge and discharge curve that we get from this sort of uh, material. And uh, the first region in green here is transition metal redox. And if you go to here and come back again, then it'll follow pretty much the same curve. But you can go beyond that, you can oxidize the oxide ions, that's into this pink region here. But when you start taking electrons from oxide ions, and then you try to come back on discharge again, when you discharge the cell, you do so typically at a much lower potential. This is, um, in the case, this case, around one volt. So you've lost a lot of your energy storage capability because energy storage is the product of capacity and voltage. We would really like to go back and forth along this uh, line here, this part of the voltage curve, charging here and discharging here, but we have to come back down this lower energy route, which loses significant energy storage. Uh, one can continue to cycle these cells with much lower um, voltage gap between charge and discharge, um, much more reproducibly, and this is what people are trying to exploit, but of course you have lost that big advantage on the first charge. So, of course, if we would like to understand how to preserve that high voltage, how to make this truly reversible in terms of voltage, not just in terms of capacity, um, then we need to understand more about oxygen redox. And the first thing, of course, we note here is that this sort of irreversible voltage profile is a signal that there's an irreversible change in the structure. So when you oxidize oxide ions, one thing that can clearly happen, we know happens, is you can lose oxygen from these materials to different extents. So just to look at at the oxygen loss first, because we'll come back to it because it's important. In this particular material, this lithium rich NMC material, one can do this with uh, DEMS with in situ mass spec, where you pass a carrier gas through the cell as you charge it and discharge it and measure the gases evolved. And that's what we did here. Uh, here's the load curve again, here's the charging curve and the discharge curve. So these are cells with this as the cathode. So we're extracting lithium from NM, the lithium rich NMC, then inserting it again on charge and discharge. And if we focus on this, this is the uh, dioxygen evolution, the oxygen gas evolution. You see some oxygen gases evolved. And I should say we used uh, O18 labeled material so that we knew, we can, we can tell that the oxygen we detect has actually come from the material and not from decomposition of the electrolyte. So this contains O18 and has clearly come from the, from the cathode material itself. Uh, there is also CO2, which contains oxygen, which also must be oxygen from the cathode. And what happens here is dioxygen comes out of the cathode. It's singlet oxygen, or some of it is singlet oxygen. It reacts with the electrolyte and that's what produces the CO2. So the point here is that both the direct oxygen observation and the CO2 are both in indicating that we are losing molecular oxygen from these materials. Now, of course, in the early days when people like Jeff that spoke earlier and Mike Thackeray uh, recognized these uh, so-called lithium rich materials that could give extra capacity beyond the conventional uh, transition metal redox, it was thought that all of the extra capacity was because of oxygen loss. But what we now know is actually the oxygen loss is generally only a minor component. It's still a problem, but it's not the main explanation for what happens when you go beyond transition metal redox into oxygen redox. Here it accounts for only about 10% of the capacity. So to understand what is really happening when you uh, charge up one of these cathodes and start oxidizing oxide ions, 
One of the techniques we found particularly powerful, we've used a whole variety of techniques, but I want to show you the results from this one because it's been particularly useful, is, is RICS, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. And, in, and the, the reason it's useful is you can, you can tune it to RICS to look at the oxygen uh, electronic states. So in RICS, um, what one does for oxygen, K-edge RICS is excite uh, a 1s electron, an electron from the 1s orbitals uh, to these empty states here, and then allow, of course, that allows the decay of electrons from the filled states back into the oxygen 1s. So it's a resonant technique. You, you excite like this, and then you look at the emission uh, spectra. And let's just take a look at these, these RICS spectra at various key points along the charge and discharge curve for the first cycle. So one plots these so-called RICS maps. So here's the excitation energy. This is the energy, the incident radiation on the material. And this is energy loss is the emission. So it's plotted where zero is, is at the same as the emission. So if you come along here, that would be emission at three at 530. And then this is the various energy loss for different emission um, uh, uh, wavelengths. So you're looking, if, if you take a line anywhere along here, you're looking at the emission spectrum for that incident radiation. And this is a typical uh, RICS uh, map. And this is taken just at the beginning of oxygen redox or just before oxygen redox onset. Then if we take a RICS uh, map, RICS spectra, uh, at the end of charge, uh, it doesn't look very different initially. But if you expand up these regions near the resonant peak, that one here, what you see in the fully charged material is a series of these lines. Now, these correspond to vibrations. And if you compare these, uh, these lines with the vibrational spectrum for molecular dioxygen here, you see they have the same line spacing, the same progression. I've also put the spectrum for Li2O2, which contains peroxide ions, and you can see it has a very different uh, spacing. Its vibrational spectrum is different uh, um, from molecular oxygen. So the bottom line here is this is a, a, a very clear signature that there is molecular oxygen. Now, this is not molecular oxygen that's evolved from the material like I showed you in the previous slide. RICS is a high vacuum technique. You take the material out of the cell and you do the experiment in high vacuum. This is molecular oxygen trapped in the particles of the cathode. And if you, as, if you look at this spectrum here in the same region here, you see no vibrational peaks uh, at this point because there's no molecular oxygen. You haven't started oxidizing the oxygen. So very clear contrast at the beginning and end of the plateau. And then if you come down here again at the end of discharge, all those molecular oxygen peaks have gone. You've re-reduced the oxygen back to oxide ions. So it's perhaps the clearest demonstration of the formation and trapping of molecular oxygen in the solid on charge and discharge. And that's what's summarized in the comment that you see, you see there. So what we see is on charging, on going beyond the transition metal limit, you oxidize oxide ions to form molecular O2 trapped in the particles, and then you reduce the O2 back to O2 minus on discharge. So the question, of course, is how does this actually happen and how can you trap molecular O2 in essentially what appears to be a densely packed um, crystal structure? So here's the crystal structure of um, the uh, lithium rich NMC again, the classic layered structure that we are familiar with transition metal layers here with some lithium, it's the 0.2 lithium here, and of course our conventional alkali metal layers. And of course, when you look down on these sorts of compounds and ignore the, the, the colors, the difference between the, the gray and the blue and the pink here, if you ignore that, you see you have the beautiful classic honeycomb structure that we're familiar with in these lithium rich materials. And if you take a powder diffraction pattern, in this region here, you can see the superstructure peaks, which are a signature for the honeycomb structure. The honeycomb turns out to be important. That's why I'm emphasizing it here. So these materials have this local honeycomb ordering in the layers. So what happens when you charge this material up and you into the oxygen redox region? 
So, the, so you could the, perhaps the clearest um, image to look at, or the clearest piece of data to look at, is the scanning transmission electron microscopy. So here we're looking along the zero one zero direction. So we're looking along the layers of our material. This is the pristine material, and you see these sort of dumbbells. The light scattering comes from the heavy elements, and the dark, the dark here the, are the lithium layers, and the light are the transition metal layers. And these dumbbells are characteristic of that honeycomb ordering that I showed you. Contrast that with a stem image taken from a fully charged material, where you've oxidized that, those oxide ions, and you see a smearing out of the, of the transition metal ions, but cr cr critically, still within the transition metal layers. The transition metal ions remain in, in the layers, but they disorder away from that honeycomb ordered arrangement. And that's reflected also in the powdered fraction pattern where the, the peaks, um, here are the peaks of the superstructure peaks of the honeycomb, uh, they're still there at the beginning of the plateau, they've gone at the end of charge and they don't come back again when you discharge. And a third piece of evidence that uh, illustrates the, uh, the changes that are occurring structurally, you can see in the lithium-6 NMR. Now lithium-6 NMR, of course, the, 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 uh, the peak positions are sensitive to the um, interactions with the paramagnetic um, transition metal ions. Uh, here is the, 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 the spectrum for the pristine material, and here's the center of gravity of those lithium peaks. And here it is after one complete cycle, charge and discharge. And the point here is the lithiums are now in different environment, a different transition metal environment, and that's another signal for this disordering. So we know this disordering is happening in plane disordering. So the honeycomb ordering is lost, in plane transition metal disorder um, occurs, the lithiums return to the transition metal sites when you discharge. So when you charge, lithium comes out of the alkali metal and the transition metal layers. They go back in at the end of, of, of discharge. And at the end of discharge, the lithiums are in a different environment of transition metal ions because of that disordering. So what, what's happening? So if we start at the pristine material here, here's our honeycomb ordering. I've just used one color now for the transition metal ions, so you can really see the honeycomb ordering. One charges through the transition metal oxidation, removing some of the lithium and oxidizing the transition metal ions uh, to end up in this situation. Remember, these uh, light blue um, octahedra represent the lithium ions, and the purple rep represent the transition metal ions. So this is a lithium in the transition metal layer, and uh, you can sort of see through these semi-translucent uh, images to the lithiums uh, below as well. So we've taken some lithium out, we've oxidized the transition metal ions here. Let's go on and charge fully. Now we've oxidized the oxide ions, we've removed electrons from the oxide ions. Uh, we've weakened the metal oxygen bond, taken pretty much all the lithium out as well. And now it's very easy for two of those transition metal ions, I'll just do that again, these two transition metal ions just have to move one here and one here. They would leave these two oxygens orphaned here, which can easily bind to the two oxygens there to form the dioxygen bond. And now we form this small cavity, this small vacancy cluster, able to accommodate, in this case, two dioxygen molecules in this cluster here at the end of charge. And then at the end of discharge, as lithium goes back into the structure, the lithium now repopulates these clusters rather than forcing the transition metal ions to reform the honeycomb ordering. You've lost the honeycomb ordering now, uh, and that's what we saw in the, in the data from the X-ray, et cetera, and the stem. You've lost that honeycomb ordering. The transition metal ions have, have migrated within the layers to form these uh, these uh, vacancy clusters to accommodate molecular oxygen. The lithium ions go back into these clusters, so they are no longer in the same arrangement structurally as the pristine material. So different structure means different potential, different voltage. And that's reflected in the fact that you come back to a lower potential than you start off from. So this is essentially what is happening um, 
oxidation of oxide ions to allow molecular oxygen to form because that's an energy sink. That's a, 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 those, that, that covalent bond stabilizes the system. And then when you come back again, uh, the lithium ions can fast, can rapidly repopulate, or not repopulate, can rapidly populate the vacancy clusters, producing this different structural environment. And we can see that in the energetics with DFT. So here's a, these crosses, each one represents the energy of the structure for different orderings of the vacancies created when you remove the lithium ions from the transition metal layer and therefore allow the transition metals the possibility of moving around. But you might ask, why would they move around? What would be the force, the driving force that would encourage these transition metal ions to create these, these uh, clusters? Well, of course, it's the formation of that covalent oxygen-oxygen bond. When you allow those oxygens to dimerize to form molecular oxygen, that's a big drop in energy. And it's that stabilization due to molecular oxygen formation, which is the energetic, if you like, driving force that encourages the reorganization of the transition metal ions into these structures to allow this, this to happen. After all, you know, the natural states of oxygen in most of our most of, of the universe is to have either molecular oxygen or in the form of oxide ions. So it's not surprising that when you no longer have an oxide ion, the oxygen species would like to form molecular oxygen. It's rather different with sulfides, where, which can form these S2, 2 minus uh, uh, ions. So um, you see that structural change, and it's just summarized on the comments that you see there. Um, we can get a sense of why the voltage is different on discharge and charge, or one of the primary uh, reasons for that. If we look a little bit more into the energetics of the oxygen 2p states, remember we're removing electrons from oxygen 2p orbitals, putting them back on, on onto, uh, into those orbitals again at the end of the process. Um, so we can understand a little bit more um, at the sort of orbital and energy level um, picture of what is driving that energy uh, change between the charge and the discharge states. So here's the environment around an oxide ion in the pristine material. Here are the lithium layers, here are the transition metal layers, um, six uh, cations around. And um, as we know, it's these weak interactions, these very ionic interactions between lithium and the oxygen 2p orbitals, which uh, push those oxygen 2p orbitals to the top of the oxygen valence band. You see the density of states here. And that's, it's these electrons that you remove when you oxidize oxide ions initially. At the end of discharge, those oxide ions, or some of them, are now surrounded entirely by lithium. Here it's only two lithiums. Now all of the lithiums, all of the oxygen 2p orbitals are surrounded by lithium. And this pushes the uh, energetics of the oxygen 2p states up even more. Uh, it's a different configuration. This configuration doesn't exist in the pristine. And this is in part an explanation of why the uh, discharge voltage is lower than the charging voltage in these materials. Now this, this um, uh, picture, <coughs> excuse me, of oxidation of oxide ions producing molecular oxygen uh, it really gives us a unified understanding of the process of oxygen redox because it's molecular oxygen that forms, whether it's evolved from the material that I showed you in those mass spec results or whether it's trapped, it's molecular oxygen that seems to lie behind the mechanism. So we can see this unified mechanism here. Here's a crystal structure of lithium rich NMC and this represents, if you like, a, a region near the surface of the particle. This is in the bulk. So when you charge up your, your electrode, you oxidize oxide ions, uh, you create molecular oxygen at the surface, as we, as we saw, and that's evolved. As you do so, transition metal ions can migrate back in towards the, the particle away from the surface. But all of this corresponds to densification you're also moving the composition closer to the stoichiometric LiMO2 composition, which of course doesn't lose oxygen. So you densify and move towards a closer to stoichiometric composition near the surface. 
and that self self limits to some extent the oxygen loss. When no longer when you can no longer lose oxygen from the surface, you still form molecular oxygen in the system. But now you have to have this transition metal reorganization in the bulk to, to create space for them to trap the molecular oxygen. And that's what's happening here. So this molecular oxygen picture um, and the stability of molecular oxygen can explain both the surface and bulk processes. So you get densification um, near the surface um, and uh, trapped oxygen in the bulk. Now it's interesting that, that um, we can get a, some uh, more of an understanding also of why doping these materials um, uh, can have a dramatic effect on how much oxygen is lost in the frame of, of this unified model of molecular oxygen explaining both surface and bulk. Um, I'm sure again many know, uh, but just for completeness, all these lithium rich uh, uh, oxygen redox cathode materials, uh, the layered ones, are all really derived from this parent compound Li2NO3 by replacing uh, manganese and lithium by nickel and cobalt or both nickel and cobalt as in the case of, of, um, of the lithium rich NMC here. Now um, if we look at how much oxygen is lost as we systematically dope Li2NO3 um, it's quite interesting um, to follow this. Look, if we look at this plot here, this is a plot of the fraction of dioxygen lost from the material as a function of how much excess lithium is in the material. So 0.33, um, Li 1.33 Tm O2 here represents Li2 amino 3. So here's Li2 amino Li2 amino 3 on this, on this curve at 0.33. And that is 100% oxygen loss. All of the capacity, all of the oxygen redox, if you like, is oxygen loss. At the other end here, when we have a fully stoichiometric composition of LiTMO2, there is, of course, no oxygen loss. Now, if simply doping um, was a, a statistical uh, dilution of oxygen loss, it would follow this dotted line, but it doesn't. Uh, what you see here, um, if you focus on the blue curve, uh, this is doping li 2 amino 3 with nickel to form the, the well-known lithium nickel manganese oxide, oxygen redox material. And what you see is for relatively small doping of li 2 amino 3 you get um, a, a high level of reduction of the amount of oxygen loss. You suppress the oxygen loss um, super linearly. And the same is true um, to some extent for cobalt doping. And this one here is the lithium nickel manganese material that I've been focusing on uh, as well. But it's even particularly dramatic with the nickel doping. Um, and the question then is why is it, uh, how is it that when you dope li 2 no 3 with relatively small amounts of nickel, how do you almost stop oxygen loss and switch to bulk oxygen redox? Um, switching from O2 being evolved to a bulk uh, reversible process. How, how is this possible? Um, so to cut a long story short, what we've observed is that it appears that at the surface of these materials, it's essentially a self-coating process. Uh, at the surface of these materials, as we know, you get surface reconstruction, and you get this uh, more rock salt-like uh, uh, surface here. Here's a, uh, an, an electron mic microscopy image at the edge of the particle, of a nickel-doped particle of Li2-3. Uh, we know this is this happens, but it, perhaps the interesting thing is if you look at the compositions at the surface versus the bulk. Um, the, the surface composition, the bulk is a, a lithium content of 1.2, excess 20% lithium. The surface is getting much closer to the stoichiometric composition. It's de it's depleted in lithium. It's rich in nickel. In other words, it's closer to the stoichiometric composition. So it tends to lose less oxygen before it gets much closer to Li um, Ti, TMO2, and it's a set effectively limiting the oxygen loss. So we have a core shell, an intrinsic core shell structure. So just in the pristine material, it naturally segregates into a nickel rich surface um, and a lithium deficient surface, which effectively acts like a coating uh, to suppress oxygen loss. And that's why relatively small amounts of nickel 
in Li2 and O3 to form the lithium nickel manganese compound uh, dramatically reduces oxygen loss and switches it to the bulk oxygen redox process. I'll just also mention in one slide in passing that um, the, 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 the model of oxygen dioxygen formation in the bulk also occurs in the 4 and 5D systems. Here's lithium, uh, ruthenium, Li2, RuO3, doped with tin. Here's the iridate. So this is a 4 and a 5D system. Well-known systems have been studied, show oxygen redox behavior. Here are the RICS signatures showing you that, again, we're forming molecular oxygen in these 4 and 5D systems. And then we come back to uh, oxide ions on discharge again. So I won't dwell on this. It's just to show you that this model of oxygen formation trapped in the bulk, this model of oxygen redox is, is um, widespread and occurs throughout the transition metal series. It also occurs even when you don't have lithium on the transition metal sites. Here's a sodium compound with magnesium on the transition metal sites instead of lithium. It also shows um, oxygen redox, so magnesium can activate oxygen redox. It also shows a large voltage loss. This is something that we didn't appreciate earlier, but we do now. Magnesium is actually displaced into uh, the alkali metal layers, which shear to O-type stacking. Magnesium is actually in tetrahedral sites. Um, and um, this also, uh, I won't go through, uh, dwell on this, which forms again these vacancy clusters and uh, uh, the RICS spectra show uh, the direct evidence of O2 as I've shown you. Okay, so um, this gives us a, a unified model for understanding what happens in these materials. But the question is, can we suppress this molecular O2 formation and get true molecular, uh, sorry, true oxygen redox, just creating whole states on oxide ions and putting the electrons back again as we can for transition metals? And it turns out we, th that is possible. Um, and to, to look at this, we looked at, at sodium uh, um, cathode materials. Uh, so sodiums in the alkali metal layers here. Um, uh, we have lithium in the transition metal layers and simply manganese. So this is a nice model system. We only have one transition metal ion and most of the capacity, almost all the capacity is oxygen redox because this is manganese four plus. And we compared two very similar materials. Um, both are sodium uh, intercalation compounds. They have the P2 structure, P2 stacking. Uh, you've seen it a moment ago, here it is here. So the, the transition metals, of course, are, uh, the transition metal layers are still octahedral, but the alkali metal layers are trigonal prismatic coordination. So they have the same crystal structure, these two compounds. They have almost the same composition, 0.25 lithium here, 0.2 here, and yet they have very different electrochemistry. The material here, the 0.25 material, shows voltage hysteresis um, and uh, the classic that we, things we've seen already. Uh, the material here with 0.2 lithium, uh, it does not show that. It shows uh, a reversible plateau. You can come back and forth along this plateau. You do not have that large loss of voltage on the first cycle. So comparing these two materials and understanding them, uh, holds the clue to understanding what can give us reversible, truly voltage reversible oxygen redox. So they have the same structure of always the same composition. What's the difference? Well, the difference between the two materials lies in the superstructure. Uh, here's the honeycomb superstructure of the 0.25 material. And this is uh, the classic um, peak in the powder diffraction pattern for that honeycomb structure in this material. Here is the powder diffraction pattern for the 0.2 material, only slightly different in composition, same crystal structure. But now we have a bold bunch of peaks here and a different local ordering in the transition metal layers. We have these, what we call this ribbon structure, not a honeycomb structure. And this is key because what we find in our um, honeycomb structure is what we saw in the earlier example of the lithium rich NMC. Here's the stem image in this case. Here are the dumbbells, loss of the dumbbells in plane, in plane disordering, loss of that honeycomb structure, just as we saw before. But, and this is the important point, in contrast, 
the material with the 0.2 lithium with the ribbon ordering and here's the ribbon ordering here's the stem looking again along the 010 zero, zero. you don't have the dumbbells now because it's a different ordering here are the transition metal ions the light ones when you charge there is no disordering no significant disordering of the transition metals and when you come back again it looks very much like the pristine in the powder diffraction you have the peaks of the superstructure ordered you charge of course you go p2 to o2 on charging because you've lost the sodiums but when you discharge again you again have the classic peaks these shown with the shading of the superstructure so the message basically is the ribbon superstructure is retained whereas the honeycomb superstructure is lost. Perhaps most dramatically seen in the, um, in the NMR, the lithium-6 NMR, where um, on the left, you have the honeycomb material, the 0.25. On the right, we have the ribbon structure. Um, here's the pristine material, and this is the peak for the lithium ions in the transition metal layers. So that's the peak for these lithium ions. One of the beauties of these looking at these two materials is it can we can separate out alkali metal ions in the alkali metal layers from the transition metal layer alkali ions because we have sodium in one lithium in the other so here's lithium in the transition metal layers when we charge the sodium ions come out the lithiums drop into the reordered alkali metal layers that are now o2 and that's the green peak corresponds to that put the sodium back in the lithium gets pushed back into the honeycomb layers into the sorry into the transition metal layers but as you can see here they're in a different environment compared with the pristine and this is because of the transition metal disorder contrast that with the ribbon here's the peak for um, the lithium in the transition metal layers lithium drops into the alkali metal layers but it comes back into the same environment in the transition metal layers on discharge reversibility it's not that the structure doesn't change at all you get shearing you get restacking and you get lithium going out and back in again to the transition metal layers but it's very reversible so we retain the ribbon superstructure we lose the honeycomb and of course therefore we can understand how it's possible when you with the ribbon structure you start here here are the transition metal ions the the, the uh, pink purple ions here here are the lithium ions. So we're looking down on the layers. This is one of our transition metal layers. At the start of the plateau, um, we then charge this, this electrode up. We, we remove sodium. The lithium ions drop down into the alkali metal layers. So we lose them from the transition metal layers. So we create vacancies in the transition metal layers. But there is no, and this is the crucial point, there's no formation of molecular oxygen uh, in this case. Um, no detection of molecular oxygen um, by, by RICS. And you get these uh, uh, vacancies, but no reorganization is occurring. And then when you discharge again, the lithium ions get pushed back into the same positions as they were before. So you're coming back along the same pathway energetically. So you come back along pretty much the same voltage here. And we've carried out DFT calculations on these systems, which uh, and the dotted line there is what you see on discharge reinforcing this reversible voltage. So, so you've suppressed the hysteresis and suppressed the oxygen formation. How is this uh, happening? Well, um, if we look at these three examples here, here's uh, the transition metal layer for our lithium 0.25 compound, the honeycomb. Here's the ribbon structure. And here's another compound, the sodium manganese, uh, oxide which also exhibits oxygen redox. Uh, in the honeycomb structure you'll recall uh, to create a space for molecular oxygen you just have to displace those two uh, transition metals uh, just one position and you've got a four vacancy cluster. If you try to do the same thing to create a cluster big enough to, 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 to uh, accommodate O2 in this compound you have to have a more complex set of reorganizations. So it's more difficult and therefore it's inhibited. And that's what's suppressing the molecular oxygen formation. And in fact, it's even more so in this example here. So it's the, it's the, um, the degree of reorganization to create the vacancy that's necessary to accommodate O2, which really allows O2 to form or not. Um, it does not a completely 
uh, the, I should say this is not the, the ribbon structure isn't a, it isn't a magic bullet, it isn't a silver bullet, it isn't a solution to all our problems. It, it, it allows us to understand that it is possible to suppress molecular oxygen formation and get true reversible oxygen redox, but it doesn't last for hundreds of cycles. You do eventually lose that ribbon structure. And in fact, here's the stem images showing that that happens. So it's not a panacea, um, but it does point to a direction of travel that if we suppress that reorganization, we could get true oxygen redox. I'm just coming to the end of my talk. Now, I think it's interesting that, um, in fact, uh, I think for the first time we were able to see what I would call true oxygen redox signature in, in the electron spectroscopy. So these are oxygen K edge X ray absorption spectra. And what you see here uh, are the absorption spectra for the 0.25 material I've been talking about uh, the pristine in black, the charged in red, and the discharged in blue. And this is the uh, additional um, whole states created when you form molecular oxygen at 531 EV. Here's the spectrum for our ribbon structure. And the point I want to really make out, there is some O2 formation, as I said, you can't suppress it completely. But this is the important point. There's a new signature in the X-ray absorption spectro spectrum at uh, about 4, 428 here. And that is um, the signature for whole states, stable whole states formed by removal of electrons from oxide ions without the, the reorganization to form molecular oxygen. So this is, this is if you like, true oxygen redox. Um, I think my time is up. Um, so I want to thank everyone uh, for listening to this talk uh, across the world, especially uh, I want to thank Shirley for having stayed up so late from the West Coast of the States. I uh, really appreciate that, that, Shirley. I want to thank uh, the, my collaborators in my group and, and elsewhere who've done all the hard work, the funding agencies, and particularly the Faraday Institution who in the UK that sponsored this, this work, but also others. And of course, uh, to thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Bruce, for uh, sharing with us all the excite, uh, exciting uh, new insights about uh, anion redox materials. I think uh, uh, you clearly have shown there's still a lot of room for improvement in the anion redox materials. So there's a quick question for you. Uh, among all the lithium-rich cathode materials that you have touched on, uh, is there anything that can truly compete with the NMC cathode? Uh, in terms of uh, you know energy density or performance, or should we keep searching for the right compounds? Yeah, I mean I think um, almost like in all these things, it's evolution rather than revolution. Uh, one can take advantage of the higher capacity of these lithium-rich materials if you accept that loss of voltage on the first cycle, because after that they they can cycle reasonably. Uh, reasonably um, well. I don't know if I can actually uh, share my screen very quickly again. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Um, and I think I have maybe, yes, uh, maybe one more slide if it's this one. Yeah, so this just shows that if you go to the second cycle, um, you, when you start charging on the second cycle, you already have this reorganized structure, you've lost the honeycomb, but now you just take lithium ions out from these clusters, you form the molecular oxygen, yes, and you come back again to uh, oxide ions, but the difference here is much smaller. You don't have that um, this diffusion or reorganization of the transition metal ions on the subsequent cycle. So you can, go, of course, go around this pathway with a much smaller voltage loss. And this does allow you to uh, um, uh, to use the material with higher capacity. So I think um, the, the 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 point is really that um, uh, you can exploit some of that um, uh, some of that advantage, but if you want to get the full advantage of these materials, I don't think we're there yet. We need to use this new knowledge to develop and design materials that can. Uh, maintain that high voltage plateau 
as we saw in those sodium compounds. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Peter. Appreciate it uh, very much your insight on the anion redox materials.